day. I um, sometimes get asked periodically, often enough, for me to think it's worth doing a video for about these wooden planes. I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that these worked for three or four hundred years and they've worked for centuries in actuality. And so um, much longer than we uh, appreciate, I think, they go back way into uh, previous millennia and um, I think we tend to dismiss them and think they're old-fashioned, they didn't work that well, they're not as good as uh, modern metal planes, when in actuality they work really well and they never stopped working well. They just didn't keep pace with the industrialising of our modern world. We needed um, more products to sell. Uh, engineers came up with new models. Stanley, you know, Leonard Bailey came out with the, the number four plane. Um, the bench plane series and, and before we knew it these were being abandoned and left alone but in actuality they work really well much better than you would expect so I'm wondering if we shouldn't just introduce these because even if everybody on the woodworking site went out and bought these planes on eBay from flea markets secondhand stalls or whatever we could never exhaust uh, the supply of these planes they are out there they're resting on shelves in cellars and, and places like that. And they're always going to be cycled through, just like the number four plane. There are enough number four planes made by Stanley and Record out there to last us for another 100, 200 years. They'll just keep being cycled through, cycled through. And this is the same thing. So here I've got a couple of planes. Restoration for this one is basically the same as this one. What you have on these, um, these planes is a a wedge that holds the blade in the plane and you've got a, a cap iron and a, an iron, a wedge and the main body and um, what I'm looking for when I'm looking for a second hand plane of this type uh, where it's a wooden bodied plane I'm looking for a cap iron and I'm looking for a main iron uh, and I don't want just the iron alone which does work but not as well as it does with this cap iron, sometimes called a chip breaker. And this really is a diverter. It diverts the shaving up and separates it from the main body of wood as you're planing and up through the throat of the plane. So that's what I'm looking for in either of these planes. There's, you can get longer planes, you can get shorter planes, you can get them a quarter of the, or a third this size for violin making. The principles of adjusting them, setting them and restoring them is basically the same. So. We're going to work on this one here and what I'm going to do is separate the plane iron from the body of the plane because we're basically dealing with two key areas to this plane functioning well. The dirt on here doesn't really matter, the patina doesn't really matter, it makes no difference. Um, so we're going to separate the iron out again. There are a couple of places that you hit, you can see there's some indents in here. Um, usually use steel hammers, not uh, rubber hammers or nylon hammers and then you'll usually see some hammer marks in the end here. There are two places that shock the wedge from its uh, wedged position holding the iron solidly in place. So we either hit here or we hit here and both of those shock the plane in the same direction. So this wedge is shocked out in this direction because this is about 44 degrees bedded in the plane, anywhere up to 50 degrees. So if we hit here or here, it's going to jerk that iron out from there. So first of all, I'm going to hit here with the soft face of my hammer because I've got the weight, a strike here, and that should loosen it, but sometimes it won't. If it won't, I'll go to the four part here, and I hit here, and that's starting to loosen the wedge. This hasn't been out in a long time. You can see it's coming loose here. Can you see I've already moved this wedge. This wedge has been in for a long time, but it's already coming out. It's about a quarter of an inch. So just keep persevering, strike, and keep striking. You can see it's coming loose now. It is, it, it is loose, but it's not loose enough for me to pull. There you go. So there I've got my iron, cap iron, and my wedge. You can see the clear wood in here is where it's never seen sunlight in 50 years. Um, this has gone dark just through 
the sunlight hitting it, oxidation. So you can see inside here, you can see all the detailed work of the craftsman that made it. And then the main area I'm concerned with now is this sole. Uh, the handle seems to be solid. Here's a couple of handles that came off a couple of other planes that I worked on. And you can see here, there's a nail through here. So this came loose. This one had a screw through here. So this one came loose and they do turn loose sometimes. What the craftsman should have done was, was boiled up some uh, animal hide glue and reseated this back in the opening, left it overnight and came back the next day instead of using the screw or worse still, just the nail. But you can see on the side here, I think, can you see here, there's a big mass of glue on each side, a good millimeter of glue on each side here, which means this didn't really fit into the recess too well. But there's something about planes that fascinate me and one of them is this, can you see how this heel of the plane isn't square to the salt, to the underside of it, it's actually angled up here and this is also angled here. So that means when this went into the plane, the heel went in first and this dropped down and it gave a nice tight fit. And then that was glued in place and it stayed there. We're not talking about restoration, but you can see here, this has been damaged, probably dropped. I would take a piece of wood like this, cut a commensurate angle to it, plane this off, glue this on and reshape it with the rest of the handle. So that's the, just to give you a little bit of background to these handles. This has got, uh, these two were closed handles, what we call closed handles. You can see these are two different makers, probably making planes at a similar time. But when you see these lines and this arc on here and this part here, there's really very little difference between them. That's very typical. Look inside through the hole and you can see the holes aligned too. So these were custom fit to the hand they fit beautifully in my hand. This one is a little small for my hand, but it does work. But I've got gloves on here just because I'm going to clean off a little bit of the, um, the dirt from this. And this is what I would recommend. Just take some boil linseed oil and some steel wool and just go over the dirty areas if it is a buildup of grease and just clean out some of this like this until you've got down to some decent wood surface. You just take that off and then wipe this um, excess oil off. And that's all I would do to this, this handle and this um, main body of the plane. Just clean up, it'll just clean out the dirty grunge that's been building up in there. One thing I want to say, if you're doing using the boil linseed oil, just clean off the excess and then soak it in water, in a tub of water. Make sure you do that. Don't leave it around the shop for more than a very short time. But already I can see the wood back through uh, the surface without taking any of the um, patina out or ruining the value of the plane. And this plane is now ready for me to work on. But doing the whole body, I'm not, this is not what I'm about today. The main body, the main part I want to talk about is getting the sole flat and then sharpening the iron and setting it up to work. So I just have a glass jar here. I'm going to stick my linseed oil in here. I'm going to stick my beeswax, uh, my um, steel wool in there. Set that aside for now so we've not got any danger points because that spontaneous combustion is very real and I've seen it happen and you don't want it to happen in your shop. So first off, we're going to take a look at this sole and uh, what I'm going to do is just take a straight edge. I've got my steel rule here. It's a Raybone Chesterman. A star at one would work well, but you do want a straight one. Offer it up to the light and I can see light on the very fore part of the, of the nose of the plane. So I've got a little belly here right behind the mouth. Can you see this rocking? So you can hear it rocking if you can't see it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take a plane. I can't really tell right now which way the grain is running. That means the grain could be coming up this direction or it could be coming up this way. So I'm going to set a, just a plain Jane Stanley, a very, very 
plain Stanley here. And I'm just going to offer it to the surface of the wood. And I can feel a little bit of resistance there, so I'm going to back the iron off till I'm barely taking now. So you can see here, can you see how that plane rocks? So that means I've got a high point right in. That's where it was taking the shaving off. I was getting no shaving here, and I was getting a shaving right here behind the mouth. So I'm showing you here that you can actually flatten this sole to a tolerable level just by using a number four Stanley plane. It feels like I'm going with the, with the, direct, with the grain. So I'm gonna go here, just take off. Can you see that one shaving went right there? The shaving went in here and out here. So let me put some lines on here for me as much as for you. Right along here, which we're aiming at getting this somewhere flat. So we're retting the flame, the main body of the plane, register here. Now you could use a longer plane. So I've got hollow here, just a slight hollow. So I have a window over there and I can see that this is hollow right in the very middle on the underside of here. I can see it hollow in there too. So now it's hollow along the length too. Let me take a bit more. I'm trying not to take too big of a bite at this stage because I'm trying to use the sole of the plane to register against. Now you can see definitely clearly. Can you see what I did here? I've got this big horseshoe in here. I've got this wide area of the mouth in front of the mouth that's coming down. And here, it's all the way up here. So there's a little bit of twist in there which I want to make sure I don't have. So I know the plane, this sole plane is already flat because I flattened it. So I'm still going to stay with this registration on here. So I'm taking down the high spots. Taking off very thin thousands of an inch. These are very thin shavings. I could take a little bit more or even more. And I keep going on the high spots working all across the width of the plane like this, because I want this close to dead flat. The last thing I want you to do is the same as I would with a bench plane. Is you, I, the last thing I want you to do is to get obsessive about flattening your plane. It's an obsession um, that I don't really find too useful. So I keep going with these micro shavings, very thin shavings like this. Now, let me see if I can show you a little bit more clearly. You can see we're extending on either side of the mouth and there's my straight edge. So it's taking me nice and flat on either side of the mouth and all the way back to here now. I have a, a good flat, but I've got a hollow in here. Less problematic, but I'm gonna go all the way down to keep taking it down. Now, what about using a longer plane if you've got one? You could use it. I'm not saying you should use it. I'm backing the iron off so I don't take too big of a, a shaving or even any shaving in this case. Take up the slack, turn it quarter of a turn. Keep, keep turning just till you see I'm getting a very thin shaving right in the middle. So you can use a longer plane as long as you're sure it's flat, fairly close to flat. How flat is flat? Well, now I'm getting very close to a total length. So I'm taking the twist out. Obviously there was a twist in this sole, which wasn't very bad. But I'm eyeballing down here. It's amazing how accurate your eyes are going to be. Back in the vise.
and I can already feel this plane is near to where I want it to be. Lots of planes are going to be a bit like this one. Can you see on here? You can certainly flatten a wooden plane much more easily than you can a metal one. So you can see shine here, shine here, and then you can see this slight hollow in the middle here. That's because this was used on the edges of boards very much for a long time. So that was used for edging boards. This plane was too a little bit. So I'm close to that finished level. And I'm gonna stop there because I'm convinced that I am now dead flat along this edge. That's going to be close enough for 99% of any woodworking that you care to do with a jack plane. That's all you need. Coat of boil linseed oil on here and you're ready to go. That's all I would do. Maybe some, just some furniture polish, some beeswax, whatever you want to use. Just to get this um, shiny and smooth, reduce the friction. But this is going to glide across the surface of any wood now and it's ready for that, I might take a quick shaving off the two corners here, just to ease the edge so it's not fractured. And we're ready to work on the plane iron. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. The wedge was fitting nicely to the uh, back of the plane iron, and so uh, the cap iron. So let's take a look inside here now. I love the way these are made. Can you see they make a brass um, dome? Usually goes through the plate. So we're going to look at a couple of areas here. We're going to focus on this one. This is how it came to me. I haven't done anything to this. Very typical. This has a convex camber. This is what hit me many years ago is that most plane irons that came into me did not have a concave. They had a convex camber. And that was how most planes were sharpened through the centuries. So didn't mean that they didn't grind them on a sandstone grind wheel two feet in diameter. They did. But it didn't mean they were aiming for a hollow grind necessarily. They were just aiming to get off this part where it tends to get thick is right here. So they wanted to keep this around 30 degrees and then take the heel off a little bit more. So we're going to focus on this. But the other face we're going to focus on, I'm surprised. Look at this. This face is really pretty good, and that's about as far as most craftsmen went. I would say that's probably somewhere around 400 grit, probably not much more than that. And that, a 400 grit, sharpened into a 400 grit, will take off very nice shavings. You don't really have to go more, but we're going to look at that. Inside here, I'm looking at this iron. I'm looking, I have to get this edge to mate to this edge as, not, as tightly as I can, otherwise the shaving goes under the fore part of the uh, cap iron and wedges in the plane and that's what causes a lot of planes to jam. Sometimes the wedge on top of this, if these wings here go slightly above that fore part, they will cause a, a, a wedging of the shavings in there too. So we have to look at those different areas, but we're gonna get this plane iron working now. So. We're going to go to a couple of things first. I'm going to go to a coarse grit of 250, first of all, using diamonds. Like this. So I'm just using diamond plates. These are dead flat, um, but I'm not worried about dead flat on this because I'm just working on the bevel. I've got a couple of nicks in this edge that I need to get out, and I also need to establish the bevel at around 30 degrees. Why do I say around 30 degrees? Because you could be 35 and the plane will work just fine. As long as you're well above the 45 degree bed, at bed angle, so when you're in the plane, the bevel isn't riding the, uh, the wood as you plane. If, you, if, it, if it was somewhere around here, you can see the iron would be riding the bed of the wood and it wouldn't work very well. So somewhere around 45, is what the bed angle in, as long as we're around 30 to 35 or 28, 
it doesn't matter, 25, 27, 35, somewhere in there is plenty good enough for what we're doing. So we're going to hold this in my usual method, which means freehand. So I'm getting my bevel down and I'm working on the heel of this. So I have actually got a gap here. I got a pretty good size gap, probably two, three mil gap in there. So I'm working on the heel to keep the heel out of the way. Now I'm working towards the forepart where the bevel meets the back. I'm keeping it flat along the edge. I'm not trying to crown this. I don't need a crown on here. Sometimes I might put a crown on. I've actually got a burr on the back here across the whole of it, which means that I have got down right to the very edge of the bevel. On these outside wings here, these are left square for some reason. That's unusual. Most of the craftsmen I've dealt with want to take these outside corners off. If you're planing a wide board, you don't want to leave a step there. You want to move into it. So, so I'm lifting up here like this. Take 20, 30 strokes. And then while I'm still raised up after 30 strokes, I start to drop down, drop down, drop down to the surface. And then I lift up the other side. Can you see where I am there? That's the train going. We've got trains outside. Wait till the train moves out of the station. Drop, 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 drop. And we've got a wing on each side, just like that. Can you see there? So that's what I want. So I've got a burr all the way along this edge now. So I'm going to go to a different series of, of plates now like this. These are just a series. You could use abrasive paper if, you, if you're stuck for diamonds, go to abrasive paper. Squirt. This is just window cleaner. This is um, auto glass cleaner. It works perfectly on these plates. Lifting, lifting, dropping down. I'm going to this plate here. This is around six to 800 grit. And you could stop there and this plane will cut. If you want to, you could just stop there and you'll be perfectly happy with the shaving you get. So I'm dropping all the way to the heel. Rather than just doing the bevel, I keep in this maintenance mode to make sure I'm not making the cutting edge too thick. Can you see in there now? So it's starting to polish out. All along. It, doesn't, it doesn't have to look pretty. I'm going on the last grit here, this is 1200. And it's a well-worn 1200 this, so it could be a lot finer than that. Drop your heel. Make sure you take at least as many strokes on the heel as you do on the main body. Now I've got a burr on this. So I'm going to flip over. I'm going to go on this plate here, which is fairly coarse. And I'm just going to make a couple of passes on here to help me determine, well, 10 passes, what I've got. And can you see right in the middle here is the belly. So I've got a slight belly. It's not really slight. It's going to take some working out. So I'm going to go to that coarser stone now to take out some of that belly. Because if I don't take that out, I don't have a flat surface. And once you've done this, you never have to do it again. It's a one-shot deal. So you may as well do it now. Drop it on the plate. Back and forth. And if this takes half an hour, you'll have the exercise on your upper body done. You don't need to go to the gym. And if it takes an hour, it's worth it. Once you've done it, you've got it. It's done for life. So you can see this is not going to take very long. Can you see? Now we've increased about three times what we had a few minutes ago. So we're going to keep going on that, keeping it flat. Keep working back and forth across the surface of the plate. Spread your fingers. I've got my thumb, my two fingers either side of the middle. 
spread your fingers. This feels pretty good steel, I must say, if you can feel the hardness of steel, which I think I can now after these long years of working with wood. So I'm going to finish this out and then I'll show you where I am when I've got this down to depth. So, wow, now I've got this down across the full width of the blade on the course 250. So I'm happy, you know, the scratch mark, can you see some scratch marks way in the middle there? They don't matter, they don't matter one drop. And actually it wouldn't need to be this wide either. You only have to have it maybe, if sometimes the plain blade is hollow, you'd end up with a horseshoe in here, that shape, an ellipse or something like that. But this works perfectly. So I've got down, you can see I've not quite got to this outside edge. Well, I don't actually need to because I could lift up on that or I could, it's, this is where it's critical along this edge here, between the two wings is critical. Get rid of that one. At least that train would leave. <laughs> so I'm going to my finer grits here. So I've got this well-worn 250 here. So I'm going to use that. Go across here again. So I'm taking out the striations left with that very coarse grit, that 250 newer grit, and I'm going on here. Take a look at the other side. And uh, I'm starting to see a shine in there. That I, it, it's coming where I want it to be. So I'm going to this one here. This is a bit more awkward because I'm restricted here. But I can go in here and uh, work this. May as well take advantage of this stone. Stuck to the surface then. And now I'm going to, can you see, I've get, I'm starting to get a shine right around the edge there. Very happy. So on this one, my final grit, this is 1200, but it's a worn 1200. And for this type of plane, I don't need anything finer than this, but I will be taking it to a final level. So we did the bevel up to this level as well. So it's good to get the two equal rather than doing the other side at 250 and this one to 1200, the bevel to 1200. I would only really have a compromise between the two grit levels of sharpness. So here, this is really polishing this. I can feel it's not taking too much off. So it's polishing, it's turning black, so I know I am removing some. And there, you start to see the shine. You can all see your face. You can see it's got a slight hollow right in the midsection there. I don't think I would worry too much about that. Just go back on, press hard on the surface, keep it flat. Yeah. So I've got a slight back bevel on there, but I'm perfectly happy that this edge is actually now sharper. The burr is on this side, so I have to get rid of those, pull out a strop, and I can work on the bevel here with the strop. Just charge this with some chromium oxide like this, charge it. This is just a piece of leather glued to a block of wood. It's just any kind of leather with the rough side uppermost. And now I'm gonna pull on here, at the very, very least 30 times. So the burr that was there is now gone to this other side. So it's already moving that steel. I'm getting down to the cutting edge. So go about 30 to 40 times keeping all my upper body above, right down to the cutting edge, both hands, the heel of my hand is pressing down, my right hand is purely guiding it really. Then I lift up the wings to get those a little bit, not too much. And look what we got in a very short space of time. We've got a polish on the edge here now. 
So I just have this inner face. Now I don't know if you can get in this close, but you can just see the burr is starting to peel away here. And uh, that means that we've got right down to the very, very cutting edge. When I come on this other face, on the flat face here, I'm not going to go on here. I'm going to go to just a regular piece of wood that I've already flattened previously. And it do, this doesn't have to be dead flat. Just get it as flat as you can get it and charge the wood itself with chromium oxide like this. And this is going to conclude the flattening of this face and you'll never have to do this again. So pull, can you see it's turning black? So it's getting this face nice and smooth and polished. So I'm going to go 30, I'm keeping it dead flat. I let it register and pull at that dead flat position. Pull. See it's going black, 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 black. That's the steel coming off. And that gets me where I want to be with this cutting edge here. Can you see that now? We've got a sharp edge and a flat face. It's, fl it's certainly flat enough for everything I want. Now this is ready to go in the plane, but one area I want to focus on a little bit and make sure I register this with you. When you're loading this blade, you don't spin it around too soon like here because you'll catch the edge of your cutting edge. Go past the fore part of the cap iron and bring it down to position this way. And about two millimeters, two and a half millimeters from the edge, anywhere between a 30 second and even as much as an eighth will work for you. Cinch it tight. And then take a look, see if there's any visible gaps along this edge. I can see a gap right on here, right in this corner, which you may not be able to see, but I can assure you it's there. So I'm going to take this out. I'm going to just go to a coarse plate and I'm going to just Move this out of the way, I think. I'm going to rub this along. Can you see, this does have a little bit of shine on this edge here. But I don't know if that's dead flat. So when I rub it along the surface of this diamond plate here, just one rub will tell me whether it's flat or not. So I keep this down on the plate here and just push like that. And you can see, I hope, right in the midsection there, there's a hollow here. Can you see it here? It's just slight. You might not, it's not as clear to you as it is to me. So I just take another couple of quick rubs on here. Like that. And now I've got the whole of this edge all the way from one side to the other. You can see it's a broad band of light on there. And that's what I'm looking for to make sure I've got to this edge here. This edge is actually in pretty good shape. So I could just take this onto the strop here just to polish this out a little bit. It's going to be fairly smooth because it's had 200 years of shavings coming through that mouth. Maybe. So I'm just polishing this edge just to get it um, so that the, there's no friction on that. And I probably won't do any more to this. I might want to expose the name of the maker. This is just a brass brush here. So you can see this is an isorby. And isorby had a very good reputation for making irons of all kinds. Long, long-standing reputation for making irons and planes. So we reload this. I'm not going to clean up this rust. There's not much rust on it. It's just very superficial and there's not much on here this is the same there's another isorby logo on there 
nice clear name. Should be proud of their name. They should be super proud. I wish they were still here today. They could be very proud of what their forefathers, their forebears did in making irons for a population for so long a period. So here, can you see there? Yeah, just about. So you don't sweat this because it will vary from person to person. Well, I usually shoot for about a 32nd to a 16th, but I vary it. Sometimes I'm working on really fine work, I'll have it closer to the edge. If I'm hogging off a lot, I'll move it away from the edge just to make sure the throat has clearance. And now we're going to load this in the plane, get rid of some of this excess here. And we're going to load this in the plane for the first time since it's been restored. Here we just drop this in like this. Now this hasn't um, been in and out of the plane for a long time. So can you see inside this wedge is hitting, in fact if I go onto this one maybe you can see even better. This wedge has a gap at the top, can you see the gap here? But at the bottom it's already tight. But that's because the wedge is flexing and the wedge is often flexed on the back of the cap iron because that has a little bulb in there. So it's hitting that first. So what I'm going to do is just turn this upside down. I'm going to just check this plain iron is flush with the sole. So I can tighten this with, I'm going to use this uh, nylon hammer. So I keep going. Can you see it's closing in on where it was originally registered. Hear that solid sound? It's not going any further. I can hit it all I want. So I turn over now and I just use the fingertip test to see how much I'm protruding. Then I'm going to look down here and let me see if I can offer this so you can see. The plain iron is actually protruding. That's going to be a lot to hog off with an, in, an initial stroke. So I'm going to actually back the iron off a little bit. And what, how I do that is I strike either here or here. And then I'm going to look down now, I think you can see the iron is not protruding at all. What you can see there is the gap. So you're looking right along the very sole face. It's not protruding. What you see is a black line between the forepart and the after part of the plain iron, and that's the inside of the throat. So I tighten this wedge up again because it loosened it. There, now it's tight. I can tell by the sound. And now I'm going to go to a metal hammer just a small metal hammer, you don't need a big one. And I'm going to take a piece of wood like this, put it in the vise. This is where I test to make sure I've got no iron coming. So I do have an iron coming through the throat. So when I tighten the wedge, it sent the iron out. So I'm getting a thick shaving on this side and a thin shaving on this side. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, you can see this is the hammer mark, that sets the depth. Hitting on the side is going to set it parallel to the sole of the face. So I'm going to take a shaving again. Now I'm getting a thinner shaving. And I'm, get, I'm still pretty close to thickness on that side. I still have a slight gap. Can you see here, I'm looking in here. I have a slight gap in there. So I've got a slight gap in there, so I'm, I've got plenty of room to tap this on the side again. And that's why these angle, these sides are angled slightly. So I'm going to back the iron off a bit here, because I'm still too thick. That second tap was to tighten the wedge again. So I'm going to slight shave in here, shaving on the other side, they sound the same. So you can hear I'm getting no shaving here. Oops, I am now. So now, I've got shaving coming off this plane that are just stunning. To set it a little bit less, a bit less still. 
and less still. Tighten here, that could reset your wedge a little. So I'm perfectly happy with my plane now. If I want to take less, I tap. Tighten. And keep going. You, you want to use this one. It's going to, your plane will last a lot longer. I don't think they had nylon at the time these planes were made. So Now I've got nothing, so I go to the metal one. I know I'm parallel to the surface. So this is my super fine level. So now I'm getting these beautiful flaky whiskey shavings. And this plane is ready to go. See what we get on this uh, wider surface now. So I'm not getting any surface. Now why is that? Is it because this is slightly hollow in the middle, it could be. So I'm going to go a little deeper. In the center I'm tapping the iron. And this plane is giving me exactly what I want, is full size shavings. The surface is pristine and this plane really works perfectly for me now. Good, that's what I wanted. Chamfers, end grain, chamfers here. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You can do roundovers for bullnoses. I'm good to go. Chamfer on the end grain. Now here, this is what you want to do, is get used to setting it. So if I take a chamfer on here, like yes, it's working, but I want a deep chamfer. Get used to tapping. Now I'm getting a, a thick shaving. So I've got a chamfer on here, perfect. And now I go back to my shallow shaving. If I want a round over on here, just bring it, bring it, bring it all the way around onto the top. There's your windowsill, there's your nosing for your stairs. This plane works well.